Hi guys, and welcome back to Let's Make a Redstone Computer. In the last episode, we created a call stack. Today is a really exciting day. We're gonna add the last main component and finish the instruction set. I hope you enjoy. At this point in the series, our computer is decently powerful. You can make programs over 1000 instructions long, and these programs can have a wide variety of code structures, like if statements, loops, and subroutines. But it's not powerful enough. If you watched the showcase video for this computer, you know that the original reason I designed it was to run games, like Tetris. And to make games, we're gonna need a lot more memory. So how should we add more memory? One idea is to just make the register file bigger. Maybe instead of 16 registers, there could be 100 or 1000. Technically this is an option, but it comes at a cost. Remember, register operands are 4 bits long, because 4 bits can address 16 different registers. So even if you just added one more register, making the total 17, 4 bits wouldn't be enough anymore. Register operands would become 5 bits long, and you'd have to completely redo the instruction set. Okay, but then why did I spend all this time making the instruction set like this? I mean, if 16 registers isn't enough memory, why didn't I just start with a giant register file and design the instruction set based on that? Well, memory works best when it's not just one big register file, but rather a pyramid. Let me explain. Memory is a balancing act. We like when memory is big, but we also like it to be fast. This is problematic because as memory gets bigger, it gets slower. So how can you design memory to get the best of both worlds? The answer is a pyramid, or a hierarchy. For example, in the computer you're watching this on, the memory hierarchy probably looks something like this. On the bottom, you have a drive, like a solid state drive or a hard disk drive. This stores a lot of data, so it's very slow. Above that, you probably have RAM, or main memory. Main memory can't store as much data, but it's a lot faster. Above that, there's the registers. These hold very little data, but they're extremely fast. Now, of course, this diagram is not exact. But no matter what the exact layers are, your computer follows some sort of pyramid, where the memory types get smaller and faster as you go up. To understand why this setup works so well, I like to use an analogy with a library. Let's say you're a big reader, and there's a library that stores all the books you could ever want to read. So whenever you finish a book, one option is to just go to the library, return it, and get a new one, which takes about an hour. But a better option would be to have a bookshelf at home. Then you could go to the library, grab 20 books, and set them on the bookshelf. Now whenever you want a new book, you'll only spend a few minutes getting it from the shelf. Well, until you finish them all and need to go to the library again, but that'll only happen like once a week. But even this is not as efficient as it could be. You could also have a backpack that stores three books. Now whenever you want a new book, you'll only spend a few seconds getting it out of your backpack. You'll still have to go back to the bookshelf sometimes, but that'll only happen like once a day. This is why a hierarchy is so great. It makes most tasks very efficient and only slows down once in a while when you go to a lower layer. Now, for our computer, a memory pyramid is a bit less useful than it is in real life. Remember, our computer is single cycle, meaning every instruction takes the same amount of time, which means any memory we make is gonna end up being the same speed in practice. But there are actually more advantages to a pyramid than just speed. So our computer is still gonna have a pyramid. It'll be a mini pyramid that looks like this. The register is on the highest layer, and a new component called the data memory below that. The data memory will be much bigger than the registers, and in theory, it should be slower. But again, it's not actually slower because our computer is single cycle. So how will the data memory work? Well, just like the instruction memory, there will be a list of addresses. But instead of a 10-bit address, it'll be an 8-bit address, creating 256 possible slots. And instead of storing an instruction at each address, it'll store one byte of data. This data will end up being whatever we want, similar to the registers. In fact, if you want to think of the data memory as 256 new registers, you can. That's basically what it is. To write data to an address, just put the address here, the data here, set it to write, enable it, and clock it. Then to read data, just put the address you want to read here, set it to read, enable it, and whatever data is at that address will come out right here. All right, let's make this in Minecraft. First, we need to make an 8 to 256 decoder. That way we can input an address and get a signal at the physical location. Next, let's make this input, a 1-bit signal to distinguish between a write and a read. I'll start by splitting every output into two, one for writing and one for reading. Then I'll just make this signal control which one is allowed through. If it's on, then it's a write. So when an address comes in, it'll output a write at that address. And if it's off, it's a read. So it'll output a read at that address. Then for the actual storage, I'm just going to use the same design from the registers, duplicated up to 256 bytes. Honestly, this is a pretty lazy solution, but it's fine for a single cycle computer. 
So let's say you want to write a 5 into the data memory. Input the 5 right here, and it'll spread out in this tree formation. Now it's directly behind all the repeaters, so it's ready to be written to any address. To write to address 7 for example, input a 7 here, and clock it. Thanks to the decoder, this makes the byte at address 7 quickly unlock and relock, grabbing the 5. Now let's say you want to read the data memory. If you look closely, there's another tree formation for reading, which ORs all the outputs together. So if you switch to read mode and input 7, the 5 gets put onto this tree and it comes out on the final output. If you read any other addresses, the output will be 0, because all the other addresses currently have 0. Okay, so as you might have guessed, these last two instructions are how we're going to communicate with this new memory. One instruction will be for loading data from the data memory into a register, which is called load. This will have opcode 14 and mnemonic LOD. The other instruction will be for storing data from a register to the data memory, which is called store. This will have opcode 15 and mnemonic STR. Let's focus on load first. Load has three operands, register A, register B, and an optional third operand called offset. I say optional because if you don't include it, the assembler will just make it a zero. Register A is the pointer, and register B is the destination, meaning it'll look at the contents of register A and go to that number as an address in data memory. Then it'll take whatever's at that address and load it into register B. For example, load R2 R3 assembles to this, and when it's executed, it'll use register 2 as a pointer and load the data into register 3. If register 2 has a 1 in it, and the data at address 1 is, say, 6, then register 3 will get loaded with that 6. But this is all assuming you have an offset of 0. The 4-bit offset value is sine 2's complement, so it can be anything from negative 8 to 7. I talked about 2's complement in LRR number 5. And so, actually, instead of using just register A for the pointer, it'll use register A plus the offset. For example, load R2 R3 1 will use register 2 plus 1 as a pointer and load the data into register 3. Note that this does not change register 2. The offset is only used for the pointer. Let's make a simple program with loads to make this really solid. Let's say that addresses 1 through 4 of data memory look like this, and you want to load this data into the first four registers. There are kind of two ways to do this. One way is like this. Put a 1 into register 1, and then do load r1 r1. This uses register 1 as a pointer, which points to address 1, and loads the data into register 1. Then you can just do the same thing for register 2, 3, and 4. Another way to do it is like this. Put a 0 into an extra register, like register 15, and just use offsets to reach all four. The first load uses register 15 plus 1 as a pointer, which points to 1, and loads it into register 1. The next load uses register 15 plus 2 as a pointer, which points to 2, and loads it into register 2. And similar story for 3 and 4. As you can see, using offsets saves instructions. It allows you to reach data in a small area without having to change the pointer. In hardware, we can support loads by hooking up the data memory like this. On a load, the ALU will calculate register A plus the offset and plug that in for the address. Whatever's at that address will come out and get selected on this MUX, and register B will be selected on this MUX, so it gets written to register B. Now let's transition to the final instruction, store. Store has the exact same operands as load, so it can be kind of confusing. Just remember, load is loading a register from the data memory, and store is storing a register to the data memory. So in a store, register A plus the offset is still the pointer, but register B is not the destination. Register B is the data you want to store to that pointer. For example, store R2 R3 1 assembles to this, and when it's executed, it'll use register 2 plus 1 as a pointer and store whatever's at register 3 to that address. If register 2 has a 1 in it, and register 3 has a 6, it'll store the 6 to address 2. And in hardware, all we have to do to support store is take register B and plug it into the data input. Once again, the ALU will calculate register A plus the offset, and the contents of register B will be written to that address. You know the drill, let's go ahead and connect the data memory to the computer, following the diagram. And that looks like this. Everything should be connected. Now let's run a test program to showcase load and store. I think a perfect test program is bubble sort. This program will use the bubble sort algorithm to sort the list of numbers at the first eight addresses. For example, if the addresses look like this at the start of the program, they'll look like this at the end. 
If you're interested, here's the equivalent pseudocode, so you can pause the video to learn how it works. I'll just manually put in some data at the first eight addresses, paste it in, and run. After many trips back and forth between the data memory and the registers, the list is sorted. Even though this is not the end of the series, the main part of the computer is completely done, and the instruction set is finished. We have all 16 instructions. But from an outside perspective, it still doesn't do much. It can run programs, but ultimately it's just a box changing its memory. So in the next episode, we'll talk about how to connect this to the outside world, like a screen or a controller. And then after that, the final episode will be about programming, because even after the computer is hooked up to stuff, there's still a lot to talk about when it comes to complicated programs. But yeah, at this point in the series, you've learned how all the essential parts of a computer work. So go out there and try to make your own. And if you want more information on how to do that, then check out Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant is a great place to learn about computers, math, and many other engineering topics. They have thousands of online lessons, each with an interactive activity. So instead of watching a video or just memorizing, you'll play with the concepts yourself, just like you would with Redstone. The lessons are available 24-7, and even with just a few minutes a day, these lessons will help you build real knowledge. If you want to learn more about programming before the final episode, then check out the Thinking in Code course. You'll learn all the essential coding elements, and you'll start to think more like a programmer. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash mapbatwings or scan the QR code on screen, or you can click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. 